Well, maybe we can segue a bit to um, transportation resilience, which you've recently been doing a lot of work on. So with the transport sector facing disruptions from geopolitics, climate change and energy security, how do you define transportation uh, system resilience from your perspective? Yeah, no, it's, you're, you're absolutely right. And um, I'll get to the definition in just a minute. But um, I mean, I think one good example of this is just in the I think it was just two weeks before the event in Jakarta that I just mentioned. Um, was when the U.S. announced uh, its new tariff regime um, and including a lot of pretty significant tariffs on Southeast Asian countries. And so um, we were, you know, arriving to Jakarta and all of the countries there were asking like, well, you know, you've spent two years working on this report for with all these recommendations, um, but what happens if we can't, or, you know, it's becomes much more expensive to trade with certain trading partners all of a sudden um, and not just in re relation to this, you know, one instance, but also, in anticipation of maybe like a kind of global shift in terms of uh, different trading relationships. So I think it's really true that, you know, you, you, things can come occur suddenly and they're completely unexpected. And so we shouldn't just always think about resilience in terms of like resilience to natural disasters, for example. Um, but I would say, you know, from my perspective, there's three important components of resilience. So there's infrastructure resilience, which is really like making sure that your specific piece of infrastructure is hardened against potential vulnerabilities and potential um, damage. And then there's more like zooming out a little bit more on the sort of network level of resilience. So if you've actually designed a network that is capable of rerouting, um, you know, goods or people when a disruption does occur, um, it has redundancies, it has alternative routes, you know, those, those are not necessarily much more expensive or much more uh, take much more time. Um, that's sort of like an element of network resilience. And then I think there's also the service provider resilience. So this is especially true uh, for freight transport. You know, you want to make sure that you have like an ecosystem of, um, you know, freight forwarders and logistics companies that can kind of keep things moving. Um, if, you know, one of them happens to, to encounter some financial struggles or, you know, they're, they're, the cyber attack happens or who knows, right? Um, so you do, it's not just always about the kind of physical assets, but it's also really about the operations and the people who are involved and making sure that you have, um, you know, a strong competitive environment where you can maintain service um, during disruptions. Well, that's a very comprehensive definition. So that's great. Um, given that hub and spoke networks are more vulnerable to cascading disruptions, what practical strategies can help decentralize critical transport infrastructure without losing efficiency? Yeah, this is a it's a really interesting question. You know, um, the the MBTA, the the public transport um, service provider in the greater Boston area, um, notoriously has a very hub and spoke um, oriented uh, rapid transit network. Um, so basically, all of the the rapid transit lines go into downtown Boston and then back out again. Um, and there's very few. Or there there really aren't any connections between the sort of periphery part of that network. Um, so, you know, I was living in in Boston when I was going to MIT, um, and for me to get to Cambridge, you know, the fastest way, or if I were, you know, the fastest way was really to walk or to bike, but if I were to take the rapid transit network, I would have to go into downtown Boston and then back to, um, back out again to Cambridge, even though it was only, you know, like a kilometer away from where I was living, I would have to spend, you know, probably 40 minutes on the train. Um, so anyways... That's just an example of the kind of hub and spoke network and how it can um, create challenges, uh, you know, just in terms of the topology. But it's also a big issue for resilience. And I think, you know, building in redundancy, I've mentioned a couple of times, I think that's important. Um, so making sure that just one kind of failure on one of the branches doesn't necessarily um, completely wipe out service um, or being able to respond quickly. And so, you know, if something does happen that you're able to get service back up and running really quickly, um, you know, the, the MBTA would do this with like bus bridges, for example. So they would have buses replace service um, along the rapid transit network um, if there was some kind of outage or, or disruption. And then um, I think also just, you know, from a network design perspective, connecting those peripheral areas uh, is really important. And this kind of goes back to, the whole like third places thing. But one thing that we found was when people were commuting, they weren't necessarily always commuting to downtown as much anymore. And they were often looking for, if you were a remote worker and you wanted to go and um, work somewhere, you know, 
within proximity to other people, you were probably going to choose a, a coffee shop or a WeWork or something in your neighborhood or in the next neighborhood over. But the trans transit system wasn't really set up very well to support that kind of uh, that kind of commuting because it really was so focused just from a network design perspective on getting people in and out of the downtown core. Um, so I think once the demand patterns shifted, it became clear that this kind of design wasn't so resilient um, to these new commuting patterns. So I guess the firsthand experience set you up well to work on Hub and Spoke networks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. How can the transport sector better protect itself from external disruptions such as geopolitical events, like you mentioned um, when we started talking about transportation resilience? So could you also talk specifically about container shipping? Yeah, I mean, this is really not my area of expertise, uh, especially on container shipping. Um, but, you know, it is something that we've seen as a major issue popping up recently. Um, you know, there's been disruptions, um, I think, sort of more climate related disruptions to the Panama Canal, for example. Um, but also these geopolitical disruptions to Red Sea shipping, um, which has had a major impact on on maritime shipping around the world. Um, I think, you know, uh, it's hard for me to say how you could potentially harden your kind of shipping routes against any sort of disruption. Um, clearly, you know, there's some major disruptions that really just can't be avoided or predicted in advance. Um, but I think more direct connections can often help. So not relying so much on you know, going back to the hub and spoke thing that we just discussed, right? If you're relying always on one major port in the region to kind of provide connectivity to the rest of the region, um, of course, you're making it, you're making yourself vulnerable to any disruptions that might happen at that port. Um, so trying to have sure that you have more direct connections from your, you know, major domestic ports to your major trading partners, um, I think could help to avoid some of that, those problems. But as far as, you know, how, like, at the end of the day, you know, the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal are like major bottlenecks. And if those get disrupted, um, there aren't really any great options um, to avoid them.